Hello, everybody. Welcome back here to the Wine with Jimmy channel. I am delighted to announce the beginning of a series here. This is WSET Diploma D3 section. So that's the wines of the world. And this is on the mighty, wonderful country of Spain. Uh, so here we have got the introduction to Spain, which is going to go through um, really the overview of Spain through history, climate, vineyard management, key grape varieties, winemaking, and so on. So of course, your holding picture there is one of my recent favorite visits to uh, Spain when I went down to Castilla y Leon and visited Ribera del Duero, took a trip about an hour and a half, half south to Segovia, the wonderful Roman aqueduct that we have there, which is just a must visit. So here you are. This is the series. It's a nine part series on the introduction to Spain. OK, so let's rock and roll talking about the history of this area. And we are looking at history here as it relates to wine, of course. So to begin with, uh, Spain has a huge influence initially from um, a faction called the Phoenicians. So you see these red arrows here stemming all the way from the eastern Mediterranean all the way to the, the western Mediterranean. Now, this is the emergence of the Phoenicians as a wonderful maritime trading uh, faction. Now, they stem from modern day Le Lebanon to so this area called Phoenicia back then, of course, and then started to move towards places like Egypt, Cyprus, uh, across the places like uh, Crete, uh, many parts of North Coast Africa, Sicily on the west hand side, Sardinia, the Balearic Islands, but of course, eventually Spain as we know it as well. So <clears throat> why are they important? Well, really at this time, which is, as it says at the bottom, when they arrived in Spain around 1100 BC, they were really at the forefront of grape growing and winemaking because winemaking and grape growing as we know it stems from off the the eastern side of this map so from mesopotamia going into places like uh, georgia and armenia and anatolia uh, which we see up here of course and so here is the black sea for example georgia's just off here so those wines then sort of filtered down towards phoenicia of course lots of trading uh, would happen and the skill set that they learned then they took with them across places around the Mediterranean. We know this because we have found a lot of shipwrecks of Phoenician origin with uh, amphora which have a uh, grape pips in for example and other things that would protect it on its route to uh, market so things like uh, pine resin. So uh, we have this emergence and they land in Spain bringing olive oil, vines, viticultural know-how and viniculture so of course our wine making. They established some quite important settlements so they have Gadir which is today Cadiz, which is the um, <clears throat> capital of Andalusia, well, the capital port city of Andalusia, I should say, uh, which is very important, of course, for the likes of Sherry, um, but also for um, expeditions going towards the Americas with the likes of Columbus. Uh, so they also planted vines in uh, Jerez, calling it Zera, and Malaca, which is today called Malaga. So really, you see this green hue here at the bottom of Spain is where they really started to influence. However, there has been uh, <clears throat> some um, uh, evidence of Phoenicians as far north as Valdepenas in the Castilla-La Mancha area, which is really just sort of uh, just around where the S is and just a little bit below that. Uh, so although these the, the, the Phoenicians are always well known for being um, really a coastal uh, tribe, a, a coastal faction that would, as you'll see with all the green parts on this map, islands and coasts, they did make it a little bit inland to Spain as well. So their wine making expertise meant that the port of Gadir, which is today Cadiz, uh, quickly became important for trading wine and evidence of their wine making, like I mentioned, uh, has been found as far north as Valdepenas, but around Jerez. 
so you'll find uh, stone lagars, for example, as well. And in fact, this city became one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire in terms of wealth because of its uh, very strategic location. So the Phoenicians were the first to really influence this landscape in terms of wine. Now, around the same time as the Phoenicians, but on the other side of the Iberian Peninsula, so majorly towards the, uh, towards the north and the central area, we have the Iberians and the Celts. So the Iberians more in the sort of central southern section and the Celts, of course, logically in the north here. Uh, the Iberians, we don't know exactly where they would come from. Some people say maybe from Sicily. Um, and Celts, of course, would come from the rest of mainly Western Europe. The Celts spread from around the 10th century to the 7th century BC. Uh, and eventually these two tribes merb and called the Celtiberians, as we see down here. Uh, some evidence of Celtic ruins here. We have the Castro de, uh, de Vilonga, uh, Villadonga, sorry. This is uh, a settlement of uh, like a fortified um, uh, settlement that you'll find. That's what Castro means, a hilltop settlement. Uh, so you'll find a lot of these in Galicia, for example, uh, and other places in the north, like Asturias as well. Um, then more factions arrive. Uh, we have the Greeks arriving around the mid 7th century BC and immediately become uh, trading partners with the Phoenicians who had arrived in the south, of course. Uh, they started to settle in places more on the eastern and northeastern area and, of course, then has uh, influence combined here. So this light blue is very much the Greek cultural influence and landings here. We have establishments like Tarraco, which becomes Tarragona, for example, here being established. Uh, and then, of course, um, intermingling here. So this is actually Greek and Phoenician cultural influence combined because the Phoenicians are more southern. So they, um, the Carthaginians also then start to land as well around the 6th century uh, along this eastern coast. And the Greeks, Carthaginians and the Phoenicians all kind of get along. They coexist somewhat peacefully um, until, of course, the next faction <laughs> comes along, of course, the Romans, which we'll get to. Uh, now, under Greek influence, under um, Phoenician influence and to some point Carthaginian influence, wine was important across all of those factions, less so with Carthaginians, but but still wine was held of important as a commerce, uh, a trading good. And of course, um, viticulture was flooding into Iberia during these times. Romans, what have the Romans ever done for us? We have the Romans arriving around the late third century BC. They started in the south and they started to move north and east. And in fact, they start to fight quite a lot with other factions like the Carthaginians, of course, really one of the Romans key, key uh, enemies initially. And they signed things like the Treaty of the Ebro, where the Romans would stay one side, the Carthaginians the other. But of course, the Romans eventually don't keep to that. There's quite a few things that happen. Um, and eventually the Romans conquer the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians eventually conquering pretty much the entire peninsula, so the Iberian Peninsula, and they name it Hispania, uh, and it's united with one Latin language. Of course, their influence is that they increase uh, and expand viticulture and vinification, uh, building on the foundations of the Phoenicians, Greeks, and Carthaginians. So they planted grapevines and they fermented in stone troughs like lagars, for example. You'll see here is the Ponte Romana Roman bridge, which is in Galicia, in Orense, which is uh, um, down on the Minho. This is the Minho River uh, in around the uh, Ribeiro era and uh, close to Ribera Sacra in the southern section of Galicia. Uh, so a bit of a Roman influence. And we had the Segovian aqueduct earlier, which is more of a Roman influence. Um, so, of course, 
these empires don't last forever and the western roman empire starts to fragment and collapse in the fourth century eventually finally at the end of the fifth century in 476 AD. Uh, this means that of course all existing parts of the western roman empire becomes fair game for other tribes and factions and we have one which is a an alpine uh, originating uh, faction called the Visigoths who eventually kind of moved their way west and at their height the Visigoths um, commanded this area really many parts of Gaul which is this uh, northern section here and all the way down into most parts of Spain what we call Spain today. Uh, their capital to begin with was Tolosa or Toulouse and then eventually that gets moved to Toledo because they lose these lands in the north uh, against the Gauls, the Gallic kingdoms. They firmly sit behind the Pyrenees, quite well protected, the, and the Gallic um, factions can't be bothered that much to come across the Pyrenees, fair enough, uh, and they sit there quite peacefully for quite some time. And in fact, they sit here for a good couple of hundred years. So their capital goes to Toledo, not far from Madrid, uh, and they start to rule a rather peaceful kingdom uh, in Iberia. Um, and they rule until 711. And that's the next thing we need to mention, because the Visigoths were really something which was born out of the Western Roman Empire and continued many traditions of the Western Roman Empire. So, of course, wine was very much a part of that. So really, we've had a huge run of history so far of really the importance of the grapevine and winemaking through Phoenician uh, through um, things like Roman, Greek and Carthaginian but, and Visigothic. And now it comes to somewhat of an end. And that is because the Moorish kingdoms, the Almohads, arrive in 711, coming from Africa, of course, and landing in the southern section of Spain in Andalusia, which is today called Andalusia, uh, And they start to move their way very quickly uh, across the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, so the Moors started in 711, pretty much had conquered most of the Iberian Peninsula in about 10 to 20 years, and then had a hold on the Iberian Peninsula until the Reconquista comes to an end towards the end of the 15th century. So really the first sort of uh, the 8th century, 9th century, the Moorish kingdoms are quite strong, but then the Reconquista really starts to take hold. And of course, uh, the Christian con Reconquest means that the Moors are pushed more, more south. Now, um, they started in Andalusia, moved north, the Moors. They moved as far north as the Duero River and a little bit beyond. Uh, and I'll talk about that on the next slide coming up. Uh, they didn't penetrate most of North Spain beyond the um, uh, Cantabrian mountain range. And wine production under the tutelage of the Moors really slowed down to a trickle. Didn't stop completely. Grape production was allowed for raisin production. Uh, and wine was permitted in certain areas, but it was frowned upon because it was against their religious beliefs. Uh, which is very interesting. This is the mosque of uh, the Mesquita, uh, which is the, um, the great mosque in the municipality of Cordoba. If you have a comment or a question, please pop it on the comment section below this video. It'd be great to hear from you. Have you been to Spain? Have you experienced the delights and wonders of this Iberian Peninsula country? Tell me about your favourite wines. It'd be great to hear about it as well. Uh, if you um, want to watch the next video, that's also available as free content, as is video three, but the latter six videos, that's video four through to nine, are available only as ex exclusive content on my portal at winewithjimmy.com. So um, the Moors dominate a lot of Iberia for many, many centuries. But really, uh, the Reconquista, the reclaiming of this landscape by the Christian kingdom starts really very shortly after um, the Moorish landings of 711. So 722, we have a battle being fought uh, in Covadonga, which is Asturias. 
the Moorish armies had actually crossed the uh, Cantabrian mountain range here, which is a very big undertaking, and then fought a battle here at Covadonga and lost and then retreated behind the Cantabrian mountain range and then sort of went, well, sod it. What's the point of going for these small coastal areas of Galicia, Asturias, and the likes of Cantabria and Pais Vasco, which we call today? So they um, they didn't. They moved back and actually retreated uh, down towards the Duero River. Uh, now, <clears throat> the Reconquista, uh, the reclaiming of this land, meant that there was a concerted effort to push south. And of course, wine started to filter in from northern areas, um, such as France and Italy, because of the, the influence of the Pope and the Papal States. So wine starts to filter in. Uh, different factions of uh, Christianity come here, like Benedictine, Cistercian, the real strict order. And they cultivate grains, grapevines, and they choose the best soils for viticulture and agriculture. And typically you'll find uh, viticulture on slopes uh, and then, of course, agriculture on the flat land. And you've only got to look at a really important wine region in Catalonia, uh, Priorat. It stems from the word priory, priorat from priory, because of an abbey here, a priory here, which is the uh, Catioxia, which uh, was established to produce wine, of course, mainly for sacramental uh, purposes, uh, blood of Christ and all of that. Um, so the Reconquista starts to take momentum through the um, 9th century, 10th century, of course, uh, and really, um, it really starts to take momentum, and, and really the Moors are pushed all the way south by very famous kingdoms like the Kingdom of Navarre, uh, of Castile, uh, and eventually they, they combine. Uh, we, we have uh, the Kingdom of Sturius becoming Leon, uh, becoming Castile and then merging with Navarre. And the, the marriage between these two fairly large kingdoms of Ferdinand and Isabella in 1492 is very important because it brings most of the peninsula under Christian rule and uh, under a collective consistent rule as well. Uh, and the Reconquista ends. The Moors are finally defeated at the Battle of Granada uh, at the end of the 15th century, and Spain claims the land of Iberia. Uh, now they have protected their own boundaries and borders. They then start to expand and the Spanish global expiration begins and Spain enters their golden age. Uh, you will find, of course, Magellan taking spice route direction. You've got Columbus, of course, going across to Haiti and, and Central Americas uh, and so on. And of course, the likes of um, intrepid uh, uh, dominators, uh, like uh, the likes of Hernan Cortes, of course, who defeated the likes of the Aztecs and so on. And the Spains made a significant mark, of course, on the Spanish part of the Americas. Uh, in the Golden Age, 16th, 17th centuries, you'll find art from El Greco and also Velasquez. Uh, the Plaza Mayor is built in Madrid and, of course, literature. Cervantes writes the um, fantastic Don Quixote, which is probably one of the most historical, important uh, works of literature from Spain. Um, then exports start to increase. So exports always depended on Spain maintaining cordial, friendly relations with other countries. Uh, and numerous wars over the centuries, of course, ensured commercial turbulence. However, it was somewhat shielded from such fluctuations by trade with its newly founded colonies in the Americas. The key exports during this time were the likes of fortified wines, of course, most notably sherry, Jerez, and also raisined wines too from the likes of Malaga uh, being quite famed for exports. Some pioneers as well going into the 18th and 19th century. So uh, we have centuries of Spanish do dominance. So from this golden age, the 15th through to the 19th centuries, um, further exploration, further uh, amounts of art and, uh, and culture. Uh, and in the wine trade, Rioja 
really starts to grow and sherry exports as well. Our pioneers are behind this growth in the north of the country. These three I have listed here. First of all, on the left hand side, Don Manuel Quintano. He was a canon in the Holy Orders who his family produced wines. He traveled to Bordeaux, bringing back not only expertise in winemaking and cooperage, so barrel making, but also some oak barriques were brought back as well. Now, very few producers followed his research, uh, and it was ruled that there should be no price differential between the various wines produced in Rioja at the time. And this meant that because these barrels were expensive, this was a new kind of approach. It was far too expensive if all wines were to be priced the same. Um, in the 19th century, we have two of these gentlemen here, the Marques de Riscal and the Marques de Murrieta. Uh, and the Spanish Civil Wars of, uh, of the 1936 to 1939 uh, meant that, uh, sorry, this is of the mid 19th century for these two gentlemen. This disputed succession to the Spanish throne at that time meant that both Luciano de Murrieta, who's on the right hand side, uh, and then the Marquis de Riscal in the middle, both sought exile in Bordeaux for some time, returning uh, when safe to do so. And they put their newly found expertise that they picked up in southern France, including maturation into barriques, into practice. The quality of their wines eventually convinced the local government and other producers that these techniques were the future for Spain, certainly in the north of Spain. This allowed expansion, of course, in Rioja. Then we have phylloxera. So in the 1860s, you'll know the story very well. Phylloxera starts to decimate France where it lands first, and it really uh, creates a drain on the production of France. And Spain, along with Italy, are very quick to step up to the plate and to offer their services because phylloxera hadn't arrived in places like La Rioja, Navarra, Aragon, Catalonia, for example. The wines of Rioja, both in their style and their closeness to the French border, were a suitable replacement. And to satisfy this sudden demand, many new wineries were founded around this time, particularly around key transport hubs like the Estación at Haro, the railway station in Harrow, which is in the northwest uh, of La Rioja. Uh, and therefore, wine could easily be shipped in bulk from the new train networks, which were springing up from the middle of the 19th century. OK, so yes, Spain steps up and starts to feed France. Now, um, Rioja starts to benefit even more from further growth. Uh, but also other areas close by. So in Castilla and Lyon, we have, of course, Ribera del Duero, and we have the gentleman on the left, which is Eloy Lecanda y Javes from Vega Sicilia, purchasing French vine cuttings to plant in Castilla and Lyon. And then also Josep Raventos y Fascio, who in Carva, he travels to France and learns the production method for traditional method sparkling wine, and of course, introduces that into sparkling wine in Catalonia, uh, producing eventually the first sparkling wine in Catalonia in 1872. Um, we then have wine production gradually recovering because we have, of course, uh, phylloxera. I'll talk about that on the next slide because it does sweep into Spain. Uh, and we have a, a rebuild of the industry in the 20th century, and La Rioja um, actually founds what's called the Rioja Wine Exporters Syndicate in 1907 to guarantee the authenticity of Rioja's wine in export markets. And then the first, the first Consejo Regulador is established in 1926 here as well in Rioja, and that is today the emblem for it. OK, so we mentioned a little bit, though, about the reduction in markets. So I talked about 
regulation on the last slide, perhaps that slide should have come after this one. But phylloxera, as I mentioned, eventually hits Spain. Uh, it actually goes into Emporda, first of all, which is in North Catalonia on the coast uh, in the late 1870s. Uh, and then, of course, it starts to spread through many parts of Spain. But the cause and remedy by the end of the 19th century was, in fact, well known. And, of course, didn't go through the extreme uh, turbulence that France went went through because really France was the experimental ground to uh, to really sort of counter the problems with phylloxera. But the commercial impact was tempered somewhat by a drop in demand. France's vineyards were recovering. So all of that wine coming from Catalonia, Rioja, Aragon, Navarra suddenly didn't have a huge market. Uh, and then also Spain was losing its overseas territories and colonies. So these two export markets, France and the rest of the, the colonies, Spanish colonies, were, of course, decreasing. So we had uh, massive employment, considerable poverty uh, and significant emigration from all parts of Spain at this time. Vineyards were replanted across the country. Uh, and many of the indigenous grape varieties were thought to be lost around this time. But quality wine still happened in Spain. Uh, it was hampered, but it still happened. We then have the Civil War of 1936 to 1939, of course, then ushering in the dictatorship of Franco, you'll see in this picture, for around 40 years. And the Spanish economy is really devastated, firstly through the immediate internal impact of the Civil War, but then through the loss of export markets during the Second World War and the economic isolation of the policies from General Franco's government. Uh, wine production continued, of course, but mainly through cooperatives who were produ producing really high volumes of inexpensive wines at that time. But we do have some key influencers. We have Miguel Torres. So um, Spanish winemakers at this time had no experience in the wider world, majorly due to those uh, isolationist uh, policies that we just talked about. But Miguel Torres of the eponymous winery did study winemaking in France and on returning to the family wine business in Penedes in Catalonia in the early 60s, 1960s, he puts his learning into practice. Some French and German varieties are planted. Uh, of course, the likes of Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlet, Chardonnay, and things like also Gewürztraminer. Uh, and you've got uh, grape growing techniques like trellising, temperature controlled stainless steel vats in winemaking, uh, and even uh, winery laboratories being tested as well, established for testing. Uh, and of course, um, this started a a, a, a real sort of revolution in the winemaking of Spain in the 1960s, and many would follow. And that takes us into the modern era. So from the mid 1970s, Spain's return to a constitutional monarchy and democratic, a democratic rule has led to greater economic freedom, of course, uh, from the general Franco 40 years or so. Spain uh, joins the EU in 1986, bringing further investment in wine production and modernization really sweeps through the country. So uh, big investment in temperature control, stainless steel tanks. Uh, so basic, more introductory level Spanish wines are certainly the best they have ever been. In 1996, another piece of legislation is passed allowing uh, irrigation, so the legalization of irrigation, meaning that more vineyards across greater number of regions could actually produce a viable crop for viticulture and it caused production levels to rise significantly. Uh, and of course, going into the last sort of 20 or 30 years, research, investment, education, experience, all of these has really given Spain a real big breadth of wine from inexpensive to very premium, everything in, in between and often very, very well made. So yes, really exciting time. We're going to cover in the whole of the Spanish section everywhere you need to know, plus a few extras, and you're really gonna get to grips of some of these wonderful parts of the Iberian Peninsula. 
Well, that's a rather long video. I do hope you have enjoyed this historical video on Spain. If you do have any comments, questions or concerns, of course, please pop them in the comment section below this. I'd like to hear about your experiences in Spain or with Spanish wine. Uh, if you um, want to watch the next video, that's also available as free content, as is video three, but the latter six videos, that's video four through to nine, are available only as ex exclusive content on my portal at www.winewithjimmy.com. And if you do find yourself in the UK, of course, look me up, give us a call or a message on social media and come and see me for a class, a glass probably a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Ciao for now. Goodbye.